-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is everybody in? Everybody there? Yeah? Okay, well, we're live on uh, the tuning fork. Let me just get this thing squared up. Hello, everybody. Where are you? Hi, John. Hello. <clears throat> Okay, we're live on Facebook and uh, on YouTube, and uh, we welcome everyone to the 25th show of the Tuning Fork. This is um, going back now from September 2020 till today, April 27th, and uh, we're really thrilled that Delia and Brainerd are with us. Um, you just give me a moment to orient my screen. Okay. Um, Where are we? We're sharing my screen. I don't know. What do you guys see? Does it look good? We're, we're, we're sharing our screen. We're sharing our screen. Yeah, but my, my Zoom, my, my panel is a Just bit messed up. Put the other tab. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know what everybody sees. They're trying to figure it out. Okay. Okay. Why don't you minimize that? And then oh, here, you, pull you that see? Up. There it is. Okay, so sorry. I'm not used to seeing the uh, screen share so immediately, but we're going to see the gallery view now. Oh, there, everybody's there. Margaret Wibner. Margaret Wibner, Wibner in, looks like you're in Austria, Margaret. <laughs> I'm still in Amsterdam, soon to be in Austria. <laughs> And, um, well, as a matter of fact, Brainerd um, and Delia, uh, Margaret and Emily and I met through your work on Facebook with the fundraising um, training, your course there. And uh, we're actually going to be meeting in Italy, well, in um, Austria next week, the, the, the three of us. Oh, so, that's exciting. Thanks to the networking of... Um, you know, our community. That's great. That's great to oh, hear. So where are you guys going to meet for? Like just to, to, to meet in person? Well, as a matter of fact, some of my films are being shown in, in Europe on the occasion of Joseph Boyce's 100th birthday. Oh, yeah. So we're, we're going to be um, stopping in um, Vaduz to pick up some objects of mine related to a performance I did honoring Joseph Boyce. We're going to visit with uh, Margaret in Austria in a few locations in Austria. And then we'll drive down to Italy uh, to a couple of different screenings. The last one of which is going to be on Capri, um, about a half a mile from my family in Sorrento. So this is quite, a, quite an extraordinary moment um, of, of travel and uh, obviously um, a bit different than the last year that we've all been experiencing. Oh my God! Yes, have you guys traveled anywhere at all since the since everything has started? Yeah, we we've been we've been um, this is a little casual kind of conversation and happy to. Uh, <laughs> well, we can we'll go with whatever format you want. <laughs> um, we've been traveling around uh, the United States a little bit, the Midwest, um, to see Emily's family a few times. Um, Minnesota and Iowa. We met um, Ron Daniels and his uncle, a chief barking dog, Daryl Brown, who's been a guest on the show, um, talking about water as well. And Frederica's here, who's been on the show. Hi, yeah, we were in North Carolina, again, visiting family. And uh, I think we had two shows coming out of North Carolina, one with um, Alan Moore about... Uh, um cracking you know um house occupy occupying right building occupying and occupying in different in different other uh, kinds of um dimensions and, and manners 
Um, and then also Patrick Mager. Uh, we hosted Patrick on a show from North Carolina as well. But we've been safely traveling around in our mobile uh, international, you know, cultural activist um, uh, truck, the Nomadic, the Nomadic Institute, searching nice. for bandwidth here and there, wherever we go. There's Sally Harris, who's been hosting us a few times, Emily's mom. Mm -hmm. uh, the road trips, all road, no, no plane. You guys haven't taken the plane at all. Well, I took a plane to Minnesota two weeks ago for a, a gig, mm -hmm. um, making a film with Emily's father, Pete, about his, his company using a drone. <clears throat> so we, um, I learned how to use a drone. I learned how to crash a drone. <laughs> I know that drones are fun, huh? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to fly together. It sounds like you guys are having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 In spite of our minds, we're having fun. Yes. <laughs> and uh, having some fun with our minds too. Like this, you know? Right. I know. This is a wonderful thing that you guys are doing. Well, thank yeah. you. And, um, we're very mindful and, and, and respectful of your time and your, um, you know, sort of willingness to help us tune into what you're doing and uh, allow us to, to, to occupy this space together for the next um, about 80 minutes now. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see our friend Carolyn Christie, who's there, and my sister-in-law, Karen Gordon Skinner. Um, those those guys are occupying a little bit of a anonymous space. Um, <clears throat> I have my new glasses on today, which is a little psychedelic because it takes some getting used to. Okay. I'm using our new webcam, so there's all kinds of you know, nuances. Well, everything here. looks good from here. Does it look good for everybody else? Is everybody getting a clear image? I, I think it's look great. Would would you? Um, I'm going to reduce the size of of the uh, Praxis screen share. Um, I was wondering, you know, uh, Emily and I, of course, we've been working as a couple um, for a few years, but, you know, as an institution, um, not yet a married institution, but we respect the institution of marriage, but this is the Institute for Cultural Activism that we created and are creating with everybody who participates every week. and. You guys have been working as a couple for a while. Um, a long we time, doing, I would say. A long time. <laughs> Can you, and by the way, you both look spectacular, and thanks for dressing up the show. Thank you. you know, Thank you. Look a little bit, um, you know, uh, inappropriate. No, it's, it's, all, it's all good. It's all good, John. <laughs> Appreciate the sympathy. So, so one thing we could do is um, we have... 48 images here. We can fire through them pretty quickly, but they're an answer to the, 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 the questions that, that we're going to talk about today. So we could just show a few slides and then you could ask a question, show a few, ask a question or however you want to do it. But um, it would give you material if you want to begin that way. Sure. Um, just tell us, give us a reference in time. When did you all meet? When did you start with your first sort of you know, conscious collaboration. Well, we happen to have prepared this presentation, so we're going to tell you right now. <laughs> so we're going to show you the images along question, with them, right? Because it's a little chronology. We'll just stop and then talk. You're making it easy for us. Okay. <laughs> That's the idea. You guys see the screen. Is the screen shares on on your end? Yep. So um, we're practice, a collaborative. Uh, and, and, and we've been working together, well, 22 years now, right? And all began in what, 1999? 1999. And, and, and we did a number of things, but, but the way we put our names was always like this, Delia Carey and Brainerd Carey. That was, that was intentional to put her name first when we came up with this. But we'll tell you a little bit more about just how we met. This was in a fashion show that Delia's sister was, was doing. And her, they were both a, a collaborative, Delia and her sister. And they made these... Um, well, we were fashion designers at that time. I mean, um, my background has always kind of been performance. I mean, like from but more conservative, like an actor, a singer, a dancer. I started being a dancer since I was three years old, you know, classical ballet dancer, 
Um, and then I took it all the way up to, I don't know, college. And then I started, you know, experimenting more with acting, singing, painting, you know, just, just uh, trying to experiment with new um, subjects. So then, and then we started working together with my sister, who she was also doing fashion designing. And, um, and then I, I collaborated with her as a, as a fashion designer as well. And as a performer, and at that time we were looking for, um, well, you know, actors, dancers, models uh, to put up a show, a fashion show, but not a very normal fashion show. It was more like a performance fashion show, and that's how Brennan and I met. Um, and then, yeah, but they needed a performer, about... a naked guy who was in the <laughs> East Village that went to do part of this show, and. So I did that, but we we um, right. So we asked them if he would be willing to be naked, and uh, I mean, first actually, and that's how we met. That's how we met in yeah. this performance at this fashion show. <laughs> that what, what is there some to. reputation that Brainerd had at that time that led you to believe he might want to be naked in the show? Well, uh, yeah, because he was a he was an artist. So you know what we what he, what we knew of him is that he was an artist. So we figure, okay, so an artist got to be open-minded, right? <laughs> so, and then, well, his friend also told us that he has done uh, uh, naked performances before that, which you did, right? At SUNY Purchase, I did do performances right. like that. So, so we met this way, and then shortly, this is what was happening in the studio. We started working together right away, but not as praxis. And on 10th Street, we had this sign on the door. One says, pray for me, tell you what you need a prayer for, and we'll perform it for you. Just fill it out and, and put it in this slot. And there would be, there's a little form there, they'd fill it out, and we said, you know, we'll perform it for you. And they'd, they'd put it in the slot, and, um, and we'd send them an email that says, your, your prayer's been performed in a kind of performative way. On the left side here, there's a sign that says, every Saturday, 12 to 5, there's free hugs, foot washes, um, band-aids and, and money, money while right. supplies last <laughs> that was for the money <laughs> and uh from Brainerd and Delia so we weren't practiced then but we started doing this this kind of performance inside there where we gave out hugs or if someone knocked on the door homeless or something who wants a dollar or anybody we, we gave them a dollar but we started basically with the uh, hugs and band-aids opening up the doors from the studio in 10th street um, and then we decided to come up with the Pray For Me, which is more like a telepathic performance, right? We decided, okay, so we're going to try to connect with people without actually seeing them and being with them. Um, so um, that worked out, worked out really nice because I, a lot of the things that we remember was like, we, we at that time in the studio, we also sometimes sleep over there, right? So it was in the East Village. So like at four o'clock in the morning, you will hear people just super drunk, filling out prayers. But then after that, you will see all the prayers that people have written and, and, and it will be very, very interesting of, you know, you, you will be able to connect with, with people without even seeing them. And I thought- well, they're writing about pain. They're all about some personal pain in most cases. I mean, some were kind of flip, it's the East Village, but but most were about a personal pain, right? Yeah, and it was very, very interesting and very, uh, very tender and beautiful to be able to connect with someone also without even being there. So then inside we're washing feet and, you know, we are this kind of uh, very young couple in the East Village then with a storefront. And there was a lot of, a lot of people came by. It was really interesting. And then um, we got married at the Angel Orensons Foundation. This is on Norfolk Street. This is in... Um, it's, it's like, I think the first synagogue in New York, but it looks like a cathedral really. And, uh, and this kind of eccentric guy, Angel Orenson owns it. So we got married there. Well, that was a story. Like two months after, after we met. Yeah, we could tell this story, but should we stop questions or should we keep going? You wanna ask any whoa, questions whoa, whoa, whoa. from this, this those parts? Performances and videos and stuff are coming up. What happened? John, John left. So, so, so. <laughs> I'm browsing. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, um, this is this is just kind of ecstatic learning about how this process occurred and how you met. Um, 
when did you decide that that was sort of your path that you're going to do this you know for a while or what was the first formal kind of um well this is it 1999 getting married and then praxis and we made this this image and praxis we thought of as it's a practice right it's it's about actions of doing something together because we were doing the foot washings and band-aids so that was the idea that it was this well, it was basically two months. We were we were together for two months, and um, we started it pretty much after a month. We were together, and uh, and then two months after we met, we got married, and that's like what pretty pretty crazy. Even our parents then were like, "You're insane!" You know, that was crazy, right? So, so. that's when everything started. Like, okay, so we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna be one entity. And that was 1999, and then in, in uh, at the end of that year, this was PS1, the Greater New York show, um, doing foot washings there. And you know, we would give these bandages. People would say where it hurts, and we put it on with a kiss. You know, for um... for emotional or physical, for whatever anybody needs a bandage for. <clears throat> so was it was it this idea that that you were providing something that was non-material but was somehow manifested through material contact with them there's not a real formal object there's not a physical art object but it's um sort of the energy the caring the uh more ephemeral mm -hmm. I don't know uh, if, yeah yeah you could say i i think what do you want to say that we, I mean, yeah. we presented it then you know as a way of talking about caring and all this as 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 that we're software developers that's how it was always presented not not as like we're huggers we're lovers we're you know that kind of thing or, or spiritualists it was that we're 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 software developers and what that means is for for the body for for the performative body so if um if we're giving out hugs it's a way of giving out shareware it's a way of downloading um system fixes to help bugs or viruses that's how we presented it then as a way of avoiding the language of, of um, yeah of whatever is all like of sounding like, vague maybe too vague about whether this is about just caring for the world and being like you know uh and it is was about us being in love i i, I think because i mean it has all the context right yeah it has everything i mean we were in love so we wanted to share with the world but without being so obvious also right like we 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 wanna just create or make actions so we can um, have this bigger bigger form. Just just only one entity with one entity, or you know, without counting entities. It's just like one whole thing happening from from different actions. Does that make sense? So that well, was, yeah. you know your your idea of of non visible art um, can also not only reference the virtual world, you know, the digital world and the virtual world, but also uh, the ephemeral world where there are energies and um, fifth dimensional sorts of um, expression. Uh, you know, so maybe we could talk a little bit more about that as, as you go, go ahead with your, with your, with your material. It's, sure. Sure. Yeah. That's part of this. This is, um, so as all this is rolling along, it's 2000, we're in the, uh, the Crater New York show, then, you know, Delia's pregnant, you know, uh, and, and right. we're going to have a like, child. <laughs> it's like everything was going super fast and, and we still weren't making a living. I was doing some carpentry and uh, we had like no money. Really. We yeah, had, we didn't had really, no money. right. We and we suddenly have about to have a kid. It's like, we wanted to have the kids. We saw it as an extension of love, obviously, right? Extension so we're coming love. up with like, what can project can we do? How can we raise money? Maybe we can ask the world for help. So basically this book is a compilation of, you know, maybe 200 or 300 letters that we wrote to people. You know, I mean, this was kind of early internet too. What year, oh my what God, year was 2000. This? 2000, right? Yes. Basically kind of um, spamming yeah, we were thousands spamming, of people basically. by getting lists and saying, you know, <laughs> we we're, were artists, spamming. we're having a kid um, and we don't have any any money. Um, do you think you could help us out? Hmm. It was really kind of like 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 brazen sort of desperate um, 
thing that was in this in this letter that was kind of vulnerable but real. But we also wanted to see the reaction of people if you know they will actually be there when you know when you need somebody, right? Also, or can you just ask for help? Does the yeah. does the money just right. come in and? Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm sure it did. You know, people were were writing amazing letters that oh God, we there were everything from how to get a job and how to do things to you know, one person even explained clearly how to become a, a pot dealer, how to buy a little and 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 and, and, and then sell it for the same amount but keep some and keep trading up. I mean, people were giving us all kinds of ideas to kind of survive and yes. Um, so you know that was quite a project. And at that time, we were actually getting uh, letters. They were sending letters. Like right. So, so, so that letters. book was published by One Star Press. Is yeah. is well, the letter? So there's an inherent there's an inherent community that suddenly became part of your work. Suddenly, it's like now you're expanding, and there's this you know interconnectivity with uh, people you'd never even met before. Perhaps some of them, right. I guess. Right, well, and it's yeah. and it's very intimate because as much as people said all kinds of wonderful things like do this or do that, they also said "fuck you, you, you know, bastards" for writing oh God, and yeah. thinking you can ask something of the world. There's a lot of abusive letters came in. Yeah, they're, they're in, there, in there too, but that's mm-hmm. that's part of it, right? That's part of. Well, that's you know, what the happens world. when you put yourself into those situations, right? You're very vulnerable. Then he was born, and we did several works kind of with him, but one of them was we were using his diapers uh, to kind of do work on paper that was on the wall without going into it too much. This is like our son's yellow shit when he's like less than a month old. <laughs> no, this on, was on all, paper. <laughs> yeah, but it was all made out of breast milk, right? So there was only right. breast milk that it, it remained. So he's pooping things. in these diapers. And, and I, tell you, I mean, diapers. I don't know, right, I'm sorry. Go no, go, I know you go, you go, and I go. <laughs> no, I feel like a lot of people might think or feel, mm, yeah, whatever, but it's actually a very, um, you know, very clean form, you know, when it's breast milk and it's all fine. And then and, and it just, it didn't even smell nothing. It's not black, it's yellow yeah. like that. Yeah. It's yellow like that. Sounds great. Come on. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> No, congratulations. Well, you know, I mean, sometimes it's, I mean, we were in a gallery just recently and there was a curator, you know, pointing to a Karen Finley video of her making a painting with breast milk. And, and she said, you know, isn't this, isn't this disgusting? And I thought, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. People see it that way, but we we're so surprised, right? That We were surprised that people will see those. Well, you know, everybody has their own their own way this is a performance at isc in lower manhattan of washing hands um and then we got into the whitney biennial this was a a huge deal of course (laughs) probably why we're here today talking to you five people (laughs) here's what we did we were we made this spiral in here that you know um a tent company collaborated with us to make a kind of a space that these, these performances would happen in because it was a weird thing like they saw us doing it in, in the east village right giving out hugs and foot washings and they wanted it inside the whitney so mm-hmm. yeah but it made for great images too giving out kissing bandages and um well now you, you guys have interviewed hundreds i don't know how many people you've interviewed around the world and you've been interviewed but certainly you've seen lots of work mm-hmm. using, you know, biologic products from the human body. You've seen, we've seen all these kinds of things. Um, have you been sort of like learning about what uh, sort of the edges of material uh, can be, the kinds of um materials you're actually working with have you like well i guess i guess yes yeah you know i don't know how you want to answer that that's what leads into the non-visible museum it sounds like because that is the edges right now this isn't like this this show at the altria which i'll just go through but this is a five thousand square foot show at the the whitney a solo show where we built buildings and and had had interactive rooms we had can you guys see all this we had a yeah yeah you guys can see it right all of a sudden, um, I realized the presenter view there, but that's not. No, 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 no. You're seeing, they're seeing okay. a full screen of this. So, okay, so, so, so that's. This, right, this is material objects, right? These are sculptures we're making, interactive rooms, a film is being made. Um, you know, uh, people are being directed. This whole thing was a giant installation where it looked like the idea was 
It's like when you're walking along New York City and you see a film being shot or you used to see that and they're taking over a whole portion of the street. You have to walk around it. In this case, and people always want to go in, right? They want to they want to go a little bit inside the film and see what's going on. So the show was called Dreams and Possibilities. And uh, yeah, and then go ahead. Well, and so it was the idea of instead of looking at just that 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 shoot going on, that movie shoot, it was as if someone said, come on in and, and they brought you like into the movie shoot and suddenly you're part of this this kind of Hollywood, this kind of indie film or whatever's being shot and you're getting makeup put on. So it's like- Right, so we guided them. We guided them like, okay, so you wanna be part of the, the audience becomes kind of the performer. So we, we get put makeup on them. We kind of uh, give them an audition, talk to them, Here's interview Richard, them. Richard Foreman is in that picture. He was directing for us within this. It was really exciting, really cool. Right. So he was he was doing all these um, performances. So then, if you come into the film, then you can be part of that. So you become basically the performer instead of the audience, right? And yeah. then this is this is Mona, which is the, the edges of, of you know materiality as you were talking about it, which we could talk about, but that's what kind of zoomed through those just to get to here. This is the beginning of, of that uh, topic. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't know if they, we don't have to show the videos of this, but Mona was a project we launched in 2011 that was a, the idea was a museum of non-visible art. You know, uh, what does that what does that mean? You know, it means it would look sort of like this, you know, one way is that there's something empty, you know, after this, we did it without frames, but the first week frames. there's, there's a I little, mean, there's a good. little card on the wall. Yeah. And then, and that card has a, a description of what's in that frame. So you have to imagine it, right? You have to imagine it. But the weird thing about launching this project was it was a Kickstarter project and we're selling these, right? We're selling non-visible work. So you know, it's a little bit of a double take, like, what are they selling? What is this? That's how it looks in a, in a would look in a gallery. It isn't a gallery that's in Harlem at our original storefront uh, uh, for this. So you just see the labels and you have to imagine it. We had press come by talking about it, right? They're, 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 just, they're shooting what's not there and Delia's is explaining to them what's, what's on the wall. So, so, you know, it got to such a, you know, a fever that the, the Kickstarter project really went viral. James Franco was part of our video on there. So um, so at, at some point he's on Jimmy Kimmel talking about the Museum of Non-Visible Art, this, this thing that, like you're saying, John, like the materiality of it is, is, is not really there. That's what everyone's grasping for. What, what are the edges of it? How can you own something, you know? Mm. Um, Right. Well, it's, a, it's 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 an analysis and a, a deconstruction of the whole uh, nature of well, composition, aesthetics. Um, I mean, you know, go through the list of um, the elements that make up uh, what we've been accustomed to as a as an art experience. Um, yeah, formally, that's that's what happened, I think. But I think what we one thing that we wanted to that was important about this, as opposed to it being a fluxus influence thing or, or a happening or something like that, is that these are being sold and that these are being sold for significant amounts of money. So in the Kickstarter, I mean, a lot of them sold for different amounts that were somewhat arbitrary how we put the amounts on, but one of them sold for $10,000. That's what, probably why what, it got what, this attention. What sold for $10,000? That's coming up. Do you want to hear him talking about it first? And then we'll show you that, that piece. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. a piece. Uh, do your best with the video. I, I hope that. Okay, yeah, see if you can hear it. I want to ask you about um, you your it? art, specifically non visible art. Okay, okay. Now, I heard that somebody paid you $10,000 for a piece of non visible art. I wish that's not true. Uh, no. So I got involved with this project with this group, uh, this couple that call themselves Praxis. And they asked me to contribute to their museum of non visual art, which is a uh, conceptual kind of art museum that uh, has art that you can't see. <laughs> now, it's kind of silly, on a certain level, like a headline, like, oh, Franco is, you know, scanning me him again. Like, yeah, it sounds like you're a genius. There's a history of this kind of thing. You know, if you 
by a, a song and a wit uh, piece. It's just going to be plans. Do you know what I mean? It's not like you buy a painting. But it's a little bit It may just be like words on a wall. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So this you get, uh, you, know, you get a description of the piece. <laughs> and then the pieces in your imagination. I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but you know, this kind of conceptual art has been going on for like 50 years. You know, I'm going to get my son a, a non visible car, I think, as a. <laughs> so look at this beautiful Ferrari that I bought for you. And people will pay visible money for the non visible Because I tell yeah. you, he says, for less than 100. They do. Oh, yeah. I really? guess somebody paid. Uh, I, I heard about that too on the, on the internet that somebody paid ten thousand dollars for one of my pieces. So I checked it out with Praxis, and they said, "Oh no, they didn't pay for your non-existent piece of work. They paid for, for someone else's you know, non-existent piece." There, so, um, so the piece that sold was. I want to ask you about. Um, this is this is the piece that sold for for that amount of money. Perfect piece. Yeah. Perfect piece. Um, I don't know if you can read it or not. Well, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it out loud. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, Praxis, that's the maker of this work. Perfect piece is the title. Uh, conceptual is the material, and it was 2011 when this um, event occurred. This is a visualization of a perfect. Oh, this is a visualization of perfect piece. Since it's not visible, it's truly perfect. It can be used anywhere at any time. By closing your eyes and focusing on the text which you can memorize. It's like having a portal always at your disposal to take you to another land that is entirely fantasy. Yeah. So, you know... It reminds us of, of grapefruit a little bit, of some of Yoko Ono's works. And um, Brainerd, you're off screen, uh, by the way. OK, there you go. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the difference in Yoko Ono or the, or, the, or the Fluxus work is her work was, you know, like a, like a poem, right? They're, 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 those are poetic pieces. And, and I guess, you know, of course, she's a conceptual artist, um, but I always felt that these were these were a little bit different because these were kind of objects that actually actually have to be imagined. And, and part of this whole project isn't, isn't just us making the work. It's really not about that primarily. It's about other people making this work, which so, was- So, so was, wait a minute. If everybody is imagining, um, if this work were communally available mm -hmm. and everybody were having this vision and it, exercising the portal um would there be more peace yes obviously right <laughs> yes so what yes. is the peace is it a piece of peace is it a window into peace you know is peace this material this dimension this ephemeral space that we can enter at will that's, uh, that sounds good, John. It's 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 what you bring to it, right? It's it's this is you know it's it's a poetic piece meant to open doors, not really to define like where it is. That yeah. This is pushing with the clouds a little bit, right? But also, but also, it's kind of for like, a, yeah. I mean, it's like it, it's what you bring to it, exactly, right? So what is is the 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 piece is everybody's individual own piece, whatever they might find it, whatever they might be. Um, we can probably all be unified and together in one piece but i'm sure at the same time we are all in our own different pieces too right that's does that make sense because we cannot i mean since we are bodies and minds right so the energy is becoming uh we're trying to be one entity right becoming on all, all, only one energy yeah. but, at, but at the same time yeah. We cannot really be, and it's difficult because we are bodies. You see that work behind me? Yeah. It says in separate pieces, it says separate entities. Right. They're all different little boxes. Right. So, of course, you know, there's this concept of what? I don't think I see it. It's okay. There's this concept that 
you know, there's this social idea of peace, but is there, you know, a universal peace that we are interpreting socially in different ways? Right. You know, but what, what, what I think is powerful about this work, I mean, one of the most powerful elements here in that particular perfect peace work is the idea of a portal. Mm. I think that as a, as a concept, the portal is really powerful. And I wonder if you've explored that as a sort of um, specific, uh, you know, topic or element and without hopefully not becoming abstract in this conversation, people may not exactly have a concrete sense of what uh, we're sort of um, exploring. But um, have you used the idea of a portal or are you, is that sort of what you're doing all the time? Well, I like the sound of that, <laughs> actually, John. Yeah, let's, let's, let's collaborate. <laughs> yeah, that's all. No, that's all. all right. No, seriously, that sounds great. No, I don't think we have. A, um, it's come up in other things. You'll see there's a little further in this presentation. But we haven't really, about, but... we haven't really put it as like you're saying, we haven't given it the, the, the specific um, defined name of using the portal. But I guess that is what we're doing. But you're you're putting it more into. But words. that's also your that's your non-visible art yeah. that you're making now. That, that yeah. that's also what happens when you hear about it. Just like Jimmy Kimmel, even though he's making fun of it a little bit with James Franco, he can't help but saying, "I'm going to get my kid a non-visible car. I'm going right. to pay in non-visible money." You know, uh, even the journalist that made fun of it had to kind of do it a little bit. So that's that's part of the I, I, idea of it, really. So maybe, but, but, but then So again, that's a good idea. To, you know, no, but, the portal <laughs> thing that sounds, that's right. There's something evocative about it. It's great to imagine, right? But right, but I think also where you're coming from, John, is like you're making, uh, right, it's becoming like a portal that you're jumping through and then it's enabling maybe the, the, the person, the, the other side of the person to be able to be in their own non-visible artwork. Does that make sense? Well, it's, it's a little bit like QAnon, if you know what I mean. Mm. It's like there's this secret thing that's going on that has all these coded messages where you can enter into the mind of that, you know, sort of culture. <laughs> and so I think, you know, if we work in a more subversive, but, you know, n healing and nurturing way with the idea of portal, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it can be very very interesting and i think that emily and i are trying to create a portal um through the tuning fork the idea of resonating with cultural activism all over the world with different people from different cultures um so there seems to be a slightly subversive uh a subversive can be interpreted in different ways but a slightly subversive um nature or or uh sensibility in your work you care to talk about that playfulness and that subversive sort of attitude or approach or philosophy? Well, this is a performance about a very famous subversive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? This is in Lubana, uh, biennial, and um, it's pouring wine. It's celebrating the miracle of, of water into wine, right? Turning it's, water into wine. Yeah. It's like a performance, right? It was this incredible performance by Jesus, really. It just kind of kind of bizarre in a way, you know, this, the story goes after, what was it, two days of nonstop partying, they ran out of wine and he got these incredibly drunk people, tons more wine, you know? <laughs> So that's what this was partly based on, um, which was very popular, you know, with curators, they loved it. Everybody reported in these, in these big bowls and ladled it out. This traveled around Europe quite a bit. And, and we also did along with that band, band-aids and, and hugs and, and ended up writing a book about hugs too. That was the first book we published together. First book ever published. And um, together, yeah. Together. But you know, then there were education initiatives, which I think is really kind of interesting about like how does this get out into the world and what does it mean that everybody can make it, as you were saying, John, like you know, the idea of uh, does that bring peace or what does that bring? I mean, in this case, it's set up like a museum, right? Mona, a museum of non-visible art. Most museums have a curatorial wing, right, and an educational wing. Curatorial does stuff like you've been seeing, like art and shows and education is where um, 
you know, there's public programming and they work with schools. But we're really into, interested in and to bring the kind of like the new medium to younger generations, right? So they can... Well, because the idea is as a visiting lecturer, right? We're coming, these are eighth graders. We're coming to talk there and they know what we're going to do. The teachers know. But what we say is we're artists. We make this non-visible art. What that means is we write in about 75 words or less, you know, uh, a description of a painting or a sculpture so, um, so, you know, they're eighth graders, they don't, they don't question it, you know, they're not artists, but they don't question it, and they just start making them. First, they all do a painting, you know, a description of one, then they all do a, a description of a sculpture, and they read them, they present them, and, um, and we'll show you some of them, but um, uh, they, were, they were really kind of beautiful. The kids just jumped right into it, and, and they also, have, here, here they are kind of presenting them there. They started spreading around the building and, and doing them in different places. Describing a monster, a painting of a monster. Sneakers on the floor, we're talking. That's what it's about. It's kind of a, a sculpture. It's hard to hear some of their voices. But these are these are eighth graders making this what, what's really is idea-based art, right? That's the idea. This is idea-based art. There's a few more in here you might be able to hear. Hey, uh, confetti that rises up and uh, each ceiling uh, uh, light Mr. Drell is one of my favorite substitute teachers. And we're turning him into a monster because anything can happen in art. Guys are making collaborative uh, sculpture. sculpture okay, no. Um, so you know, as as as, as, as a way to you know, you know, we we all go to school, right? Thinking, learning like how to draw or something, right? But um, but these kids are are making non visible art, and it teaches them about that you can do idea based things, right? I mean, I'll, I'll end it there, but. You could, you could just start, I mean, that's what we want to bring to all the schools, uh, if possible. You know, I mean, it takes a, a lot of um, a lot of time and, and, and thinking of how these people are going to complement it, but a new medium of creating, uh, you know. Just like they art. did. I mean, I didn't, there's more images in here. There may be in here, but I've, I've also the kids, um, how it was shown at the school because then they put up these cards and I can read a few of them to you here or John, if you want to read a few of them. Um, Thank you. I'd love to. Um, maybe, maybe the first three or something. They're really short, but they're three kids, different kids. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity to do that. So there's Robert Earhart. Um, his work is called Flower Field. It's a painting, 2017. This is a huge painting, 30 feet long and 15 feet high. There are many colors on this painting. It looks like a rainbow, but it's not. It's a field, a field of many flowers. There are red flowers, orange flowers, yellow flowers, green flowers, blue flowers, and purple flowers. It's very pretty. There are also many bees on the flowers. The painting is called Flower Field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's two more underneath there that I think we should read. Roll, they're very different if you want. Oh, oh, let me scroll down. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, this is Arsh Jain. Gods at Bay. Painting. 2017. This painting is a picture of the Olympian gods standing on Mount Olympus. They're looking down in horror at the actions the humans are doing. This is during a nuclear war. You can see despair in Zeus's eyes as he knows that the world is beyond saving. You can see many explosions in the background. This represents humanity's destruction and hatred. 
That's an awesome one. Yep. <clears throat> Amazing, right? Yeah. yeah this is Ma Michaela Demori Demorias, Chameleon Painting, 2017. When you touch this work of art, the purple brush strokes turn to a deep blue. All you have to do is place your fingertip on the glass and the color will react to the heat and spread. The beautiful colors will fill your mind and calm your thoughts. This painting is called Chameleon. I love that one. <laughs> nice, right? I mean, <laughs> see, you know, these kids, eighth grade, first, first it. try. That's what they get. And, and then their parents come to see these, these things on the wall. And so the parents have to wrap their head around it a little bit. Like, this is non-visible art. And of course, the teacher's enthusiastic. Yes, look what they've done. And it, and it kind of brings everybody into a kind of, um, you know, I mean, we could really talk about philosophy or, or some very abstract fold. Pataphysics, where, where, yeah, pataphysics, where you know this this edge of what 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 is material, what's real. We could go in a lot of directions on this, but that's what it's happening when the parents are in there and the kids are proud of their non-visible work, and the parents are imagining it and talking to them about it. Everybody's taking this, this strange leap into a world where it sounds like you know something conceptual artists like us might be doing, but, but for these parents, it's very weird. But it's as easy to buy into in a way as. Um, do you, do you guys um, identify as conceptual artists? How do you identify, if at all? If at all. If at all, yeah. I, I prefer so today, today to live it like that, if at all. <laughs> so today I was thinking of what, I mean, it was a very cliche thing, but when John Claude and, and, and Christo used to, people used to ask them that. And, and I noticed in interviews, because we were also were friends with them, they would say the same, she would say the same thing when, when asked about anything like that. She'd say, we love labels. But for wine, not for us. <laughs> and so, I know that's yeah, funny. we kind of feel the same, similar way. Yeah, we don't really like labels. So that's that's. But you you get that, John. Yeah. Because even the hugs was like, what is it, performance or not? It's not really yeah. performance. We're getting hugs too, you know. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, maybe. Yeah, maybe sorry, lab labels are just um, placeholders or or portals, mm -hmm. perhaps, if we're not too attached to them, mm -hmm. or possessive of them you know, or too greedy about occupying them. <laughs> but um, maybe they're like gifts, you know, that we can temporarily offer. But I, I, I find myself somehow continually associating to your work with like, okay, there's affection, there are portals, there's um, parenting, and there's teaching. Right. It's as though, you know, these um, exercises or experiences are like mediums they're like material that you guys are in a sense offering as your non-visible um oeuvre you know and that's that's so uh generous and and um and evocative um but you go on what, what is it that makes your, what, what is the sense of um interest in teaching not every artists or you know not everybody wants to teach they used to say those who can do and those who can't teach but it sounds like your teaching is doing and so what is the sense of accountability or responsibility that you seem to be occupying in this you know exercise of teaching that um has some kind of sense of uh, responsibility about it. What is what is going on there? Why is that important? I mean, why is it important for kids to okay. to learn about to learn about idea based art at an early age, at eighth grade? Why is it important for you Perhaps. to to uh, to share that? Why is it important for you to pass that on? Because no one else is at the moment <laughs> that I know of. I don't, I don't know. No, it is important because uh, you want. Uh, we feel like new generations need to 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 need new mediums. I mean, just as simple as that. They need new mediums to have more expansive uh, ideas and to feel that mm, there are not limits and we're not limiting uh, people. And 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 the way you know the way everybody is growing up, it's becoming. Uh, I don't know, everything is too rigid, no? 
to expand possibilities in the arts. And right. You know, so art isn't about a particular talent. It's about, and we know that's the case. It's how you how you think about it. It's you know. So we're interested in the arts, arts education, and I think you're right. Mentioning a kid, we're interested, and in, I think that's what kind of sends one in a way. Having a kid, and I remember, you know, he was homeschooled at the beginning, and we went to. Uh, museum in New Haven, the British Museum for an art class. And they had the kids at like five trying to sketch a, a Henry Moore. And I thought, you know, mm -hmm. they're all struggling and they can't do anything. And I thought, this is crazy. And, and we started giving tours at the Yale Art Gallery across the street, mm -hmm. just contemporary art and, and just having the kids draw whatever they saw. And I, I think that was a real turn on. That was exciting to see kids engaging and talking about everything from Duchamp to Lichtenstein to- Yeah, know. well, that's another thing, right? It's a turn on, you know, we enjoy others uh, enjoying. I mean, no, we enjoy, I mean, right, seeing others enjoying. Maybe it's a parental thing too, right, or no? Yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe, yeah, I'm not sure if maybe we'll, we will have not done it if we, we weren't parents. Yeah, that, I, I don't know, maybe. Well, let, let's go deeper into your 48 and, and um, See where where we land. Well, this is the um, whoops. Let me see. Um, oh yeah, yeah. This is the end of it then. So now we're doing something. We're in New Haven. We've been in New Haven throughout the pandemic, and um, so one of the things you see in in New Haven is is you know is people with people with signs like this, right? The homeless. You know, we think about the homeless in a lot of ways. So. What struck us, and this wasn't planned as an art project, we're presenting it here uh, for the first time. This isn't something we've talked about, but it's something that we do and is part of social practice and is in line with everything else. It's certainly in this context. So we see these signs and we think, you know, what's well, these guys need better signs, you know, um, better visibility, right? You can't read these things. So we made signs you know, went to a sign shop. We didn't really design the sign. We asked the sign shop, make a sign that says kind of homeless, uh, anything will help. And the idea was to give them um, signs that would give them more visibility. And, you know, we didn't know whether it would work. It's, it's a really kind of odd project, right? But we said to them, do you want this? And they say, yeah, sure. And sure enough, we went back and they told us, yeah, it, it works. And they gave us tips for like how to make it better. This guy said, well, you know, it's a little flimsy. What, what I did was I put like kind of clear type of duct tape over the front and back. So it's durable and weatherproof. So then we started doing that to the others, you know, cause it's, it's not about, uh, you know, we start improving our, our design, it. right. It's yeah, their design. We listen right? to them. Yes. Whatever the design is, uh, this guy <laughs> said, um, yeah. he wants it. He needs a backing, you know, he needs it like, like mounted on foam core or something. Um, so the next one we're going to try to make it on a foam core or something yeah, yeah, yeah for him so that's really that's the end of this project there's only one more slide about a, a project well, that's, that's even newer but that's the it, were the, all the folks that you worked with in new haven on the street um cooperative were some of them not interested or how did how did that sort of community um you know sort of express itself in different ways well, it's interesting what you hear, like this guy, you know, he starts talking to me when I came by the second time and said, is it working? Does it need any improvements? And he said, yeah, that should be mounted on board or something. It's that that's stiff enough. But then he started telling me about the homeless in the area. He said, there's a whole family that's, you know, sleeping in that Lowe's building. I think there's, you know, something wrong with them, mental illness, but it's, you know, two or three kids, parents, and they're, and they're sleeping in a cement building all winter. You know, there's a, there's a, and he said, I, I share this corner with someone else, you know, so sometimes they talk to us about like, you know, their, their, their community a little bit, um, but, you know, it's not like we get into conversations. No one has said no to the sign. I don't want Okay, it. right. Yeah, nobody has said no. So we're seeing where it goes. It's kind of, it's kind of odd, um, you know, but well, it, for us, it's like York, visibility, right? Visibility. In New York one time, right? Oh yeah, I gave one. We happened to have one driving in New York. I was waiting for this. I was picking up my son just recently and waiting outside a place. And the guy came up to the window and said, "You know, can I have some money? You know, or something." And um, it was like Sixth Avenue in the '30s or something, right? And so I said, "I don't have any change unless you take credit cards." And I said, "Do you want this sign?" Because I have them in the back seat of the car. And he looked at it. 
He said, no, 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 I don't need a sign. I don't need a sign. Because <laughs> he doesn't. He is just there with a cup. He's just, you know, you're, you're, you're right there. So New York is very different, too, I think. Yeah, yeah. Different it is. It he really said, is. if you only have a credit card, you can go into that pizza shop right there and get me spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> so we went there, got in the spaghetti and meatballs, then we added more stuff because we wanted more stuff. <laughs> it's a very different yeah. culture in New York, I think, you know, in a way, as opposed to suburban. They like homes. to ask for what they need, I think. In a way, right? It's, 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 well, I I say get more signs out there. Let's let's do this. Let's do it together. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was one of the notions of should we do like a Kickstarter project? But it's kind of a delicate thing to frame, you know, uh, how, how exactly this goes out into the world. And I mean, yeah, we don't want there to be credited to anybody that this is a a praxis project. Really, that's not so much the idea, but just this idea of visibility. You know, it, it is one of these as we see it. I mean, we've only presented it here. It's the only time we've shown these images. And even then, and we can talk about what that means. Is it, you know, how do you frame something like this as an art project? It's not something we signed our names to, but it's something that's out there in the world that, that, you know, I mean, we're being sort of almost like creative designers, I think. It's like trying to make a little bit of a better spoon. This is like trying to make a better sign, as odd as that is, you know? Mm. I don't know. It's, I think it's a little... I mean, who cares whether it's art? Right. Well, yeah, but I mean, we're framing it in this context. We just did the, this is the end of a slideshow about all our projects and art, and this is what we're doing. And it's, uh -huh. it's something that creative people may do, but it's to, yeah, to whether it's art or Yeah, but not. I, I mean, it will be lovely. I mean, if you, right, you guys are traveling a lot on the road. It will be amazing, right? If you guys- Yeah, do you want some of these signs? We'll print them and send them to you. That would be that would be a thing. Does anybody want some of these signs? If you want them, we'll print them and send them to you. You know, it's it's you just pass them to somebody with a do If you guys drive by it or in your area, that's that's great. Yeah, I'd love to take you up on that, John. You know, that was the uh, idea initially that Dahlia was talking about this and give them. Do you know out. Warren Warren Niedek? Do you know Warren? I do. You know, they yeah Warren created this um, with his friend, his his partner as well. Um, drive by art. So okay. there were art products in some kind of manner or form that people could actually see but only from their cars mm -hmm. and this is a very other sort of perspective this is um you know uh intervening with the social economic system the pandemic year for sure yeah. it's pandemic during the pandemic, pandemic projects during the pandemic yeah. and i think it's a really powerful project and i I'd love to help as much as I can. Maybe Emily and I can talk more about it, but we do have a truck. We're happy to, um, you know, be part of it. And um, we have some projects we'd like to share with you too. Um, but perhaps, you know, we will come to a conclusion and let some of the folks on board here um, interact with you too. Yeah. Um, but the, this was what you say, the, the end of the show? The 48 objects, images? Yeah, the parallel art world is a future project, but we should just take questions, yeah, because that's just a kind of completely open idea. Well, one of the things I'm just curious, because uh, I'm delighted, Emily and I are both thrilled to have met Margaret Vibmer through your uh, portal <laughs> on the Facebook uh, page about fundraising for artists. Is this part of your social practice? Is this um you know part of the non-visible uh, museum work is it uh you know one of your workshop concepts um tell us a little bit about that and uh and thanks again for making this amazing introduction for us about about, about you mean just the fundraising itself what what the, 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 the... you're mentoring artists in the sort of skills of fundraising and, and sponsors yeah that was the first class that and talked, right? also the, the, the imaginary the imaginary force that it it demands to actually find aligned sources of in of revenue or support right. for artists right. this is right. an imaginary process too it requires no no it's just, it's just, it's just, yeah yeah well that's going back to what we were saying before which is we enjoy seeing others uh come their dreams to fruition whatever they might be 
right? That's mm -hmm. so that's part of what it takes it that you know we enjoy uh, giving the knowledge or teaching whatever uh, knowledge we have to be able to um, open the door for people to to move forward with their own dreams, right? I mean, for us, that's right. For us, it's it's patrons have enabled that. You know, from the Whitney performances on, the the we weren't selling paintings at a, at a fast clip. We were the kind of artists that need funding that need uh, quite a bit of it. And when we had a kid that increased, you know, mm -hmm. so um, we kept relationships with sponsors and still cultivate them and patrons and the relationship grows, you know, um, financially and, 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 you know, personally, almost always. And, and, and as well as grants and teaching, which we're just interested in sharing, you know, it's. Um, but everybody, most of the time, nobody speaks of those things. It's a little bit like taboo, right? Nobody wants to speak of how can you sponsor your dream? Or how can you make your your dream come true, whatever the dream might be? Especially if you don't have uh, you know income. Our our, our parents are, are all dead. We don't you know we don't have uh, that kind of an income. So it is you know down to right. How, how do you how do you survive? How do you do this? And how do you stay at the edge of materiality and all that? And um, hmm. so for us, oh. that first thing was patrons, and, and that's been a core of it. And that's what enables us to keep making things too. So you're you're flying by the seat of your pants, so to speak, or what they call flying without a net, right? Um, inventing it as you go along. Not exactly, but there's this, a similar attitude we've had going along. What do you mean inventing it as you go along? Inventing what? I don't, I don't understand that. Uh, your existence in the material world. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, sure. That that sounds good. Yeah. I so is is there some? Aren't we all doing that? Aren't we all doing that? <laughs> no. no, no, no. Very often it's the material world that's navigating us. Mm, yeah. Um, I think that that um. What I'd like to say is that you must have some capacity, some nurturing process that you have that makes it possible for you to live in a state of some degree of unknown or uncertainty yeah, that yeah. became something familiar um not necessarily not by necessity but in some way in a choiceless way you've occupied that that experience mm -hmm. and you're teaching people how to do that too yes so uh can you tell us just a little bit maybe perhaps about what your inner resources are what practices you may employ or uh, suggest to people that might be um, stabilizing for them, for us in these times of uncertainty and uh, getting used to the unknown as though it's a familiar place? How do you, how can you tell us about that? What to do? That's a big question. I don't know. It's great to be in love and have as much sex as possible. I can tell you that's one way to kind of weather it. If that's possible, you know, intimacy, right? I, I, I don't know, it's very- no, I, no, but I mean, I think we all have to find our own. I mean, I know what you're saying, John, it's very difficult to um, to sometimes, but, but in a way I, I feel like it's it, not everybody can live in that unknown state of mind, like you're saying, right? So how can you give some advice to somebody to put them into that state of mind if naturally, they're not there, right? Well, so it's the ultimate portal. It is yeah, the yeah, ultimate but, but, portal. But is, You're is, right. Isn't I that love loving? That. Isn't that loving? It's 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 loving. It is loving. Yes, but like, but, but like but, being loving, however that is, whether you have a partner or right. But loving it doesn't call it just for a partner. It calls it for however you can. Yeah, however you can focus the love. That, that's that's right. Yeah, I like that. It's however you can focus love, love into yourself. For example, if you don't have a partner, right? Uh, love into an animal, uh, love into your loved ones, uh, or if you have a partner, a partner. Uh, I think what you meant by sexuality also, if, if you know, if you have a partner, or even without a partner with sexuality, but basically it's just like focus into love, right? That's what kind of makes sense. Intimacy, intimacy. Intimacy, yeah. Do you know the work of Esther Perel? She writes about, she talks about that kind of... Um, the pandemic that things are sped up a little bit 
So, mm-hmm. you know, relationships can break up. Right? There's more divorces. There's also a lot more marriages happening now. You know, people wanting to do it now or never sort of thing. So, so I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like I don't, I don't really have advice, but that things are sped up. So things are more intense. Well, I mean, the also, being I mean, loving, I think, works, helps in general. Whether, you know. I mean, well, you know, like everybody knows, meditate more, right? I mean, try to meditate, just stay in the moment. I mean, it's basically how can you stay in the moment without thinking of the future, right? And then and, and because the future is what puts you into the stress moment and what doesn't allow you to, to live in that moment that you're mentioning, John, about we feel comfortable there. And you're right. Yeah, I didn't think about that. It's interesting. We do feel comfortable there. And we have always been, right? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> He's back. He's back. I just went off into this unknown. Uh, you did. I, I didn't want you to lose me uh, permanently because... We were following you. We were following you. This, if I lose this cable, you see, yeah, I will disappear. <laughs> this is... um. A, a moment Here's your of non, physical. This Here's is a your physical form. Form. <laughs> non-visible performance, potentially. <laughs> but let's turn it over to to other 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 uh, hearts and minds, and yeah. um, thank you guys for being so vulnerable, and um, you know, lighthearted about some of these matters that are pretty pretty heavy. Yes. Um, so uh, well. Frederica, you have your microphone on. I do. Hi, guys. It's hey, nice. Frederica. We miss you. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, you know, we're, we're going to come back in mid-May, and I can't wait. And hopefully we will see you not too long after that. It's really, I loved listening to you, and I've followed along and been to some of your events, but to I've been on the bylines. I have not wanted to come up and do. I've been watching <laughs> room rather than participating because I'm very shy in those kinds of situations. Um, maybe not anymore now that I'm old. But anyway, um, that whole idea of focusing love and the I've been both in the position as an artist with a child and absolutely no money and having the miracle of my light bill say costing $64 and 15 cents and the healthcare cooperative sending me that amount. And then when I called them up and said, why did you send me this check? Having them say, oh, please don't follow this up. It will cost us so much money to figure out why we sent that to you. And that kind of thing. Now I have money. And the, those miracles no longer happen. But I think one of when you're in that state of mind that you guys are in, things do come to you when you need them, right? I mean, it's absolutely bizarre how it works out. So it was just wonderful to hear other people say something that I have experienced in my life. And I haven't heard very many people talk about that. And it's all about focusing love. When, you know, when I ran out of money and I had 15 cents left, I couldn't wait to give it away. Because <laughs> right. I knew, okay, I got to keep it flowing here. Yeah. And for a lot of people that can't work. It just can't work. They're too wounded. You know, we created a society with so many deeply, deeply wounded people that that idea has no place to land. So, but meeting, I just love you guys anyway. Thank you. That's Thank you. Nice yeah. to see you, Frederica. Thank you. Um, I want to ask Margaret Ribner. Margaret, yes. what have you gotten from the experience you've had directly with um, the fundraising course, the, the project on Facebook? Well, uh, you know, as, as an artist, no matter in what, at what kind of stage you are in your career, there are so many, uh, you know, reasons why you need to, uh, to find, uh, you know, either ways of getting your work out there to be seen or, like for instance, I mean, I've been working with a number of galleries, but then uh, like even like 
one gallery in Amsterdam that is very, uh, yeah, very well known gallery. But even if you are in a position like that, it might not work for you for some reason the work is not really getting out there so then at some point i realized i have to find an alternative way so i was looking for um yeah for a network i mean the 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 great thing about praxis is that it's it's a big network of people who are in different stages of their career um and actually i'm i'm like not uh like on it every week or so it depends on how busy i am with other things but um yeah i've i've uh, i mean there's so it's just it's an incredible source it's it's an incredible resource you know of information of all kinds of information for uh you know sponsoring projects for getting your work out there for also thinking about how to um, position yourself um, at this time, you know, because so many things are changing at the moment. Um, yeah, we've been doing uh, Zoom presentations, for instance. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's just, and, and I just really enjoy uh, um, Actually, when I joined Praxis, it's been kind of like the beginning of meeting people uh, at the other side of the world. Or, I mean, for me, New York is home, home, but at the moment, because we cannot travel, it's like the other side of the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you see, then I met you, John, for instance, you know, I mean, this is just, it's so crazy, right? It's like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's maybe a new, a new, um, a new era that we can, through these kind of digital networks, uh, we can create real re relations. And, and I would have never believed that before. It, it just, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you for those Thank nice you. things, yes. Margaret. Thank you. Those yeah, nice yeah. No, it's 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 been really rewarding, and it's like I always um, I just you know like um, I get the, the this uh, newsletter like every Sunday, and then there's interviews with artists, interviews uh, you know that you do on um, on the Yale radio, right? uh so there's just it's just a ton of resources you know? it's incredible yeah so and, and you know i also feel like because i've been like a member now for almost a year but i don't really i mean oftentimes i'm just busy with my own things and it's not like i feel like i'm i'm using it like all the time but but for for me it's also like i feel it's such an important uh, resource for so many artists so I also want to support you guys so that's how I see it. so my contribution is also su supporting you because I because I think you do really important work thank you thank you so thank much you, Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> thanks Margaret um, I want to just read a message quickly from uh, Sally Harris who had to leave the, the uh, session great helpers to other human beings her chat about your work oh this is very nice great oh, i see yeah that's beautiful nice and also until today i didn't understand what your model was so somehow that did not get into my brain but now it is what the what was the, the model the, the model of sponsorship that you were talking about right right, right. i did not get that so I'm very happy that now I got it. <laughs> I've got to go, guys. Okay. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Great nice to see you, Federica. You. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Great to see you. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, we just switched. So hopefully we shouldn't get feedback. You're just starting to get feedback. You're starting to get feedback. Oh, no. Let's, let's, um, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, still feedback. Yes. Okay. okay.
But let's just go with it and see, you know, it's kind of like your second Emily is speaking. <laughs> Rock stars here. Um, I, <laughs> I really appreciated your um, work with children. And I'm sure the kids were very into it. Did you get any parents who were... Um, having problems or difficulty with your approach? Uh, no, we didn't. I mean, I, I think also that, I mean, that's, that's the kind of beautiful thing about like a parent and a kid, right? The parent, even if they think this is the weirdest thing and, and maybe like even, uh, you know, something, <laughs> something that's like fooling them, their kid is really excited and proud of his or her work and the parents are trying to understand it and and for, i think for a lot of the parents you know that's that's what it's all about you know it's about them sharing something and even if the parents don't get it they they probably wouldn't get a painting either you know <laughs> really well i mean i think or maybe maybe we have been lucky enough yeah that we have. haven't found somebody you know like uh like yeah. i really love the way federica put it very wounded people you know because you know i'm sure we could we could, I'm sure the more we do it, I'm sure we're going to get that. So that's a good point. But are you coming in as um, visiting artists? So you're only there for a set period of time? Right. Yeah, like, but it's, parents, yeah. For, parents, they have um, just a specific idea of what art is, and they'd like these skills to be um, taught to their children and... Um, so I love that you're, it's like this yeah. elastic, elasticity of mind that you're cultivating with mm. the kids. Well, and, and, and the fact that we've had great shows like, like the Whitney also gives the parents this sense that, you know, because who are we? What are we talking to their kids about? You're artists from where? You know, it's <laughs> a, they need, they, they need a, a little understanding that this is real, that we've shown in museums. So that makes makes them more grounded makes them yeah. take a leap the idea is like to take this leap you know because it's a thing at first that doesn't make sense and, and when it does it kind of turns people on it's exciting right so well, it's also like you're surfing you know you're using the whitney thing and you're surfing into other areas uh, on that board you know that's that's a... it opened up a lot of doors that's for sure yeah right yeah. uh well, well, I'm wondering, I'm wondering why, why is my thing right here? I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you were, were to um, be in the position, position where survival, 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 financial survival, were not an issue, how would that change your method of working? Do you imagine? Wait a minute, that's it. With the, say that again. Like, like if, if we had. So that that again. <laughs> If, if basically, if money were not an issue, mm -hmm. how would that change what you do? I don't think well, it well, would. Be more, be more specific. Like, what does that mean? Is there an unlimited amount of money I now have access to? <laughs> I mean, like, be really clear. If money is not an issue, that means the bills are paid? Or does that mean you can do what? what? No, but I don't think it would change in, regardless. Because it's not, you know, that's who we really are. I mean, you know, money or no money, right? Because, like... I mean, well, I mean, yeah, but if you want to hear like fantasy projects, you have to tell us how much funding <laughs> you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, that's how I read that, you know, unless I'm missing you. So, Vera, can you please tell us what you're, what's on your mind or you'd like me to read that comment? Because I think um, the voice aspect of this exchange is uh, Wait. ephemeral yet powerful. Where is that? Vera Dickman. No, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, sorry, I came in a bit late. I was in a different Zoom meeting, would you believe, also some other of course. activists or activists. But anyway, no problem. But what, I, what I found also interesting is that you spoke about trust and bond and love and, and focus on love. Actually, it's interesting because people often feel um, very isolated because they, they've, they've lost actually their 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 trust of others or their ability to relate so when you come to the homeless and you actually approach them 
you're actually relating to them and you're rebuilding their trust and their ability maybe to the, to relate and their belief in themselves as well. So mm -hmm. it's a really empowering action apart, quite apart from the fact that you're interested in helping them with their signs and then they get involved, but it does more than that. And I think with the children too, it's very empowering because it gives them an experience of something new, but which is also part of them. It's really in them, you know? Yeah. And so the unknown is also in them, but it's also part of them. And somehow you're giving them access. So in these times in which things are so uncertain and when we don't know what we can count on, if people can have access to their own resources, that's really, really a lot, you know? Yeah. Uh, but realizing that, that the wealth is also in them. And, um, yeah, the interventionist, you know, um, stuff, seeing stuff from the outside, the billboards, it's true that being able to to make a difference by getting stuff out there. Like I know William Kentridge in South Africa, he invited people to contribute statements that could go onto billboards. So then you see, you know, you're driving down the street and you see a sign that says, breathe, you know. Mm -hmm. You see another one that says, weigh all tears, you know. And mm -hmm. suddenly, like, you're kind of stopped in your tracks because there's not these advertising billboards and it's talking to you. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're saying something to society and you're, you're interacting. And it's, it's not nobody's paying to get that up, but... Nobody, you know, I mean, obviously the billboards, the, the city, somebody buys them. I mean, you know, buys, buys it. But it's what you're doing, how you're transforming society by actually, you're not, you're not foisting anything on them. You're opening a space in them, in, in the viewer, you know, you're opening a space. And, and I had an experience of... Um, we we have a series of workshops called well a group called embracing the unknown you know mm. and we do workshops called um, e spaces of creative encounter but one of the things we were invited to do by one of the artists was experience try out a piece of um, instructional art like like Yoko Ono's work but except that I didn't really know that it was called instructional art and I didn't know any more than I knew about non visible art you know that um, it was something that um, as a group we could experience and then on you know in our digital spaces we went and we did whatever it was the instruction was in our rooms and we used our space to experience that pressing up against the wall you know the going right into the wall and through the wall or whatever it was and if we didn't have a wall we used a window but it nonetheless allowed us to share some art together simply by listening to the artist reading and telling us what to do, you know, and then we could share it. So there are all these in-between spaces where th something doesn't have to be incredibly um, tangible or buyable in the usual, in the way in which you have to possess it, but it needs to open up a space in you. And it seems like you, you've you been able to, to do that kind of thing and make it possible to to get some funding for you know, for opening up spaces, but I, I think it's really necessary in this, you know, in the period in which we are, that people can see the mm -hmm. space in them that can open up, you know? Yeah, I love that. I think that's yeah, so true, that. the open up spaces, because, yeah, yeah that's what, I, I mean, to be so literal about that, but that's what, like, hopefully happens to like a young artist right there's a space that's opened up where you think i can do that or yeah. something happens and you think wow there's more possibilities and you know that's such yeah a lovely a lovely phrase I to also open love, up a space i love the part that you said about empowering that's also wonderful too it's yeah, true yeah. right yeah that's wonderful so it's valuable what you're doing definitely and you know if you found i didn't hear the beginning and your model and how it all works but you know, obviously I can hear there's a network, there's something that you've built, there's something, there's a way in which you're making it work. And uh, yeah, I think that's very valuable. I really, really do. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Actually, Vera, I, I, think, I think, Vera, it might be really worthwhile for you to see the beginning of the show, maybe the first 20 minutes or so later on sometime. No, actually, yeah. I know you're busy. I had watched but the it's, videos it's, um, online before a little bit. I'd watched, but I mean, that was, but okay, I'll go back to the beginning of the show. If you put it on YouTube, because it, is it on YouTube as well? Because it wasn't. It's there instantly. A moment ago. Well, I mean, not when I came in anyway. Oh.
Okay, I see. That's good. good to know. Yeah, I well, mean, I was uh, going to come in surreptitiously and I couldn't. I was going to go full place into the damn Zoom room at this time. But anyway. Um, I think it so, was but it seems to be recording, so it is somewhere. Yeah. It is somewhere, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Vera. Yeah, that was very interesting. You put it very, very well, very well put. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, never, never thought about yeah, that before. Yeah, never thought about with, it, yeah. with a, you know, with a homeless, the way you put it, and yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, Vera's in, it's, Vera's it's, in it's, Paris, and yeah. Margaret is in Amsterdam. Oh, wonderful. Maria is in Marianne? North Carolina. Nice. <laughs> um, so, unfortunately, Babette is not here tonight from Amsterdam, but she's often here. Mm. This is our 25th show, and well done. Wow, we, well, well done. Well, Congrats, 25th. We, should, awesome. we keep on going, Vera? You mean beyond tonight? <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> but of course you need that, right? You need to, it also has to find a way, but you found a way. Some kind of a well, way. We need Delia and Brainerd for um, showing us the way. We're, we're, <laughs> we're somehow in their wake. They started ahead of us, but um, we're we're just creating this community here, and um, mm -hmm. it's extraordinary that we've met so many people, and some of those people are working with each other, um, and we're working now, for example, with Margaret through uh, Brainerd and Delia's interface. So, um, well, next week we're going to Italy. We'll be, um, first of all, in, in, um, in Vaduz, in Austria, provided that we can get across the border. We believe we will with our working sort of documents. Wow, that's professional. happening. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, keep, keep in touch with you, Vera. Okay. Um, and we'll be in Europe for three weeks. Okay. Uh, having an option to come back later or sooner. But there are scheduled screenings in Italy of um, Joseph Boy's Transformer. Uh, on the occasion of Joseph Boyce's 100th birthday. Nice. So we, we, um, we're we a little bit uncertain about the next broadcast, but um, we're sort of exploring the idea of alternate weeks every two weeks. And it's, it's great that people can be here even on sunny days uh, here in America. Um, you know, so thank you all for being here from the US. Um, anyway, uh, we don't need to say goodbye, but maybe uh, Marriott down in North Carolina. Hi, Marriott. We're we're talking about doing a residency project with Marriott that perhaps Brainerd and Delia, uh, you guys would like to talk with each other sometime too. But just say hello, saying hello to you, Marriott. Hi. Marriott. Hi, everybody. Uh, I I've been um, working with some people in the yard. So I did hear some of your, your talk. I didn't hear the whole thing, but I wanted to just make a comment about um, your work with children in the schools mm -hmm. and um, just how brilliant that is and how important it is. Because, you know, we live in this capitalist society and Vera touched on the, the idea of, um, you know, how product and, you know, actual con consumerism is so prevalent in our society. And the kids need to be able to tap into their imagination and to value that and their ideas. And that it doesn't have to be a tangible, like physical product. It can be an idea that can actually be, you know, manifest. It can be, they can, keep it going and, and actually make it happen in the world. And when I was teaching art appreciation in colleges, um, I did this project with my students that was called Art to Change the World. And it was strictly like a conceptual art exercise and they loved it. Mm. So it, it was a similar idea, I think, to what you all are doing in the middle schools 
And um, yeah, yeah it's we just would like love to keep that going. That's really our thrust this year yeah. is to keep that going to get into more schools because we'd like to see it's set up as a program, which we've developed, uh, you know, um, a kind of manual for us so far so that teachers can just teach this. We don't need to be there to right. explain how to do it. Teachers can show them how to do, you know, non-visible paintings. And, and you know, what comes out of it, like you're saying, is they could manifest it, but it, it's also like beautiful words. Kids are saying things that you, you, you heard that one about the end of the world. Yeah, they, they, they often do things that are kind of heartbreaking and or, yeah. or just poetic or, or confessional or you know, they're amazing texts. So uh, yeah, to see that go around to, to not only give kids the, like you're saying, a sense of, um, I think what can be done, you know, what the possibilities that are out there. But, it doesn't uh, have to be material, yeah, I like that. But expression too, it's expression. Like right. when you're writing about a painting, I mean, we didn't put it, all these ones in, 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 in Lublana, but in that biennial, it was very funny. There was, <laughs> it was Eastern Europe and, all of everybody's, you know, I mean, I know this sounds cliche, but everybody's non-visible art was very dark and dreary and yeah. anti-capitalist. And, yes. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was all, of a, all of a piece. So, you know, uh, yeah. it's, it's interesting how, how it sort of reflects the people. And, and yeah, so that's what we're most excited about. Is, is, is that, so thanks yeah. Yeah, Marianne, for, yeah. for supporting that because that's what we want to see happen. Yeah. That shows the influence of the culture, though. And I think, you know, kids can understand that. That yeah. if, you know, a group of, of kids start thinking in a certain way, it, it's influential and it impacts other people in the room just uh, as, a, as a cultural um, experience. All right, all right. But I, I really support, I totally support what you're doing and I love it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank so much. You. They can teach adults how to do it. <laughs> yeah, you can teach adults how to do it. You can teach adults. We'll, we'll send you the manual. You can, you can go by it. It's, it's, yeah, it's they cool. can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they can. But they have to wrap their heads around what it is. Once, and then it's it. not just to make it, but then to have an exhibit. Yeah, because yeah. Because making it is a little bit almost like a poetry exercise or something. Right. But then when you hang them on the walls, absolutely. and then you have other people there in a physical absolutely. opening everybody's starting to figure out like, what is this? This isn't a joke. This okay, isn't, you know, okay, something's okay. happening. And, and that's when it really clicks. Amazing. If you do a workshop of it, you know, because yeah. we didn't even show you images of it installed in the school, but you know, it was, yeah. That's what's really also very exciting. The, the interaction there. Well, it'd be nice to, to make a film about all your work, string it together. Yeah, that would be Frankly, um, but I think also what, what, you're causing to happen is a, in the children, their brain is getting hardwired for this type of thinking, this modality of thinking that's uh, not uh, defined or confined by um, something that, you know, Marriott is suggesting is occurring in the, in the consumer world, not driven by consumerism. It's driven by something um, more essential and deeper, obviously, but the, you know, Neuroplasticity is a big deal when you're working with young people. The brain well, is this also, also literally a little mind bending. There's something yeah. weird that happens with it that parents would buy in and get it and understand. It's hard enough to understand your kid wants to go to art school. He's making non visible art. That's 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 another leap that it's either real or it's not. And you know, I, I think that's what's that's what's so amazing when people take that leap. It is a kind of an artistic. Well, I'll bet you you've blown some minds out there. It, it's inevitable. You had you had. I think the kids blew some minds. That's the thing. Like <laughs> we did this with the kids, and then the kids show their parents. You can be sure, but that's not there. Their minds are being blown. You made non visible art. Uh, you know, yes. these are parents who are all thinking their kids are going to be superstars in college. Probably, <laughs> it's like, what yeah. are you doing? You know, they have to. To me, that's what's really interesting. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, of course, the influence of the kids and their future. But that parents have to have to buy in because it's their kid and, and they have to make a switch. Otherwise, you know. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like saying something bold just because why not? Sure. And it's kind of like artists are not defined by the art world, you know, but the art world is perhaps defined by artists. Mm -hmm. And we got to keep up that work of not getting confined or trapped into an identity, but um, fluidity seems to be what's 
what's very helpful right now, and, and I think it's something we're learning during the corona time. Um, but well, artists run institutions too, like what you guys are doing. This is a kind of a type of institution, right? You and Emily are making this artist um art, artist project artist institution and you know i think i think that's a great thing to do as artists as creative people is to create platforms uh so you know portals 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 likes the word portals right john yeah <laughs> thank you more portals need to be developed by artists and yeah yes. it can be anything from and the interview series is like that it's a portal right you're listening to other people but so are you know resources film centers uh you know, artist spaces, uh, artistic collaboratives. Mm. We'd like to announce that um, Meredith Monk has offered us uh, a work of hers, a composition that was um, played. It's called Anthem. It was played by musicians all over the world. Um, and it's going to be part of our uh, the Institute for Cultural Activism website uh, page called Sanctuary. Wow. So people can actually go to the sanctuary on the website and have this experience of Anthem and other sorts of resources that nurture, inspire, and catalyze uh, oh, work. Uh, Sounds oh, great. Yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's a very, it's a very oh, beautiful that's thing. That's beautiful. Congrats. That's cool. Yes. That's great. Thank you. So when is that going to be uh, ready to go? Well, if we, can, if we can launch it before we leave next week, that'd be perfect. And we'll announce it, you know, digitally in the internet and through, through our mails. Yeah. We're also just part of a, you know, virtual gallery exhibition that we'll we'll share with you more um, through our, our, our email. Okay. Um, so thank you all so very much, uh, Delia and Brainerd. You guys are monuments of inspiration. And thank you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, yeah, Emily. Thank thanks, you. Vera. Thanks, thanks Mary. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks a lot for coming, guys. Thank you, really love. Thanks, John, for hosting this and, and sharing and it with your with yeah. your network. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, folks. And um, Emily, thank you so much for, for both of you, of course. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, good night to everybody night. on, on uh, the Tuning see. Fork and uh, Facebook see. And, and YouTube. Be safe. See okay. you all soon, yeah. one way or another. Yeah. Hope so. Great. One way or another. Yep. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao. everybody. Ciao. Bye. 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 Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Uh, are you turning it off? What's going on? Who's turning it off? Hmm. Are you on the screen share?